welcome David Shank. Thank you. It has been a, a day of inspiring stories, and um, I'm honored to be here. That's, this is what TED is all about, tapping into profound ideas, and then riding those ideas um, to extraordinary heights. Um, but I think that there's an elephant in this room, and um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, this topic is, is perfect to, to, to try to face that elephant down. Um, the elephant is the nagging question that I suspect is lurking out there in many minds, because I know it's lurked in my mind for many years. When you're, when you're watching someone uh, perform who you think is, is great, or you're hearing a story about someone who's, who's great, the, the, the elephant in the room is that nagging question, am I capable of, of great events? Is, is, do I have that potential in me, or is it just these people I'm, I'm watching or hearing about on stage? Um, Am I right that that is lurking in some of your minds out there? Just say, mm-hmm, yeah. Um, <laughs> give me an mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, so I thought we might actually bring up the house lights just a little bit, if that's not too much of a trouble. And I'm going to count to three. And everyone who's thought of something that um, they just don't, not sure if they're capable, a dream they're not sure if they're capable of achieving, because maybe they're limited in some way, because they just don't know if they've got the genes or the, the brain power for it, or whatever. I'm going to count to three, one, two, three, shout. And when I say shout, everyone will shout. And you don't have to shout if you, don't, if you think that this you don't, isn't your problem. But everyone will shout uh, what, um, what they wonder if they're capable of, you know, the, the dream that they're just not sure that is within them to achieve. OK. One, two, three, shout. Excellent. We'll have the, we'll have the transla transcribers and translators decoding that. Um, so as a matter of fact, um, there are a lot of people that believe that we're stuck with, uh, many of us are stuck with mediocre genes and therefore a mediocre mind. And um, this was actually embodied in a book about 15 years ago called The Bell Curve. Um, and the message of The Bell Curve, one of the messages was, um, Sorry to say, but there are people with good genes for intelligence. There are people with bad genes for intelligence. And this is just the way it is. We can't do anything about it. Um, they called it um, genetic uh, separation. Um, and here's a quote from the book. The irony is that as America equalizes the environmental circumstances of people's lives, the remaining differences in intelligence are increasingly determined by differences in genes. Putting it all together, success and failure in the American economy and all that goes with it are increasingly a matter of the genes that people inherit. Um, now, they did have science to back this argument up. I strongly dispute that science, um, but I don't view these guys as racist, actually. I think they were, they were arguing what they thought science was telling them. Um, and it's a pretty depressing message when you think about it. Uh, you don't even have to think about it. It's right there. Um, <laughs> Only some of us are capable of, of extraordinary success. Um, well, I spent the last several years researching for a book um, that was just mentioned uh, about the science of human potential. And I'm going to spend the next uh, 14 or 15 minutes explaining why I think that these, these authors of the bell curve actually got it dead wrong. So we're going to start with a story about rats from 1958. <laughs> You got, your, you got your rat dopes. I didn't think this was a funny slide when I made it. <laughs> Wait till you see the cat. That's, you think this is funny. Uh, you've got your rat dopes and your rat Einsteins. These are two different breeds uh, of rat that were, that were actually genetically partitioned, just as the bell curve authors warned people would uh, eventually be. Uh, they're genetically partitioned for intelligence. So over, over several generations, these, uh, these rats, these two different breeds, were raised for two different kinds of intelligence. And this is the uh, running of the maze that uh, shows how reliable this was. This is after many generations. They ran these 
um, two different breeds through a maze. And so you can see the rat dopes are making many more maze errors than the rat Einsteins. So what these researchers did um, at the University of Manitoba in 1958, they took the same two groups and they wanted to see how environment affected the, uh, the outcome. So they raised new generations from each breed in a rat slum. Imagine, I mean, a, a rat cage is already kind of a slum, but, <laughs> but imagine it much, much worse. Very little light. Uh, again, this is not, <laughs> I'm glad that you're finding this funny. It's true. Uh, uh, very little light, no way to, uh, for these rats to exercise their brains or their minds in any way. They raised these two breeds in, in, it's a, in this uh, slum, and uh, then they ran the, the new generations through the mazes, and look what happened. The, um, <laughs> the genetic differences, the apparent genetic differences that had been around for many generations uh, between these two breeds basically disappeared. The rat Einsteins made just as many mistakes. Then they did the opposite. They tried the opposite environment. They... Uh, made what I call the Rat Four Seasons Maui, which is lots of light and lots of uh, patterns on the wall and every possible rat exercise machine you could imagine. And except for the freedom part, it was like a rat's paradise. And, and they raised new generations of each breed in that, and, and uh, they ran it through the maze, and almost the same result as, the, uh, as with the slums, the genetic differences all but disappear here. There is a slight difference, as you can see. The rat Einsteins made slightly few errors, but that was deemed statistically insignificant. So again, basically the message is this reliable genetic difference between these two breeds disappeared. How could that be? This really defied understanding in, in the 1950s because that's not how they thought of genes. They, they had a certain way of thinking about genes, a certain model. Uh, we can call it the blueprint model. This is uh, like this blueprint uh, uh, of the Eiffel Tower in that genes, and this is still the way that most people in the general public think about genes, genes have very specific information for what your traits are supposed to look like. Um, they have instructions that are right in, inside the gene that is, this says that you're supposed to get a certain eye color. There's an instruction inside a certain gene or a set of genes that says what your height is supposed to be. There are instructions inside genes that say how athletic you're going to be and, or how musical and so on and so forth. The, the blueprint model. Well, what happened was over the ensuing decades, um, a, new, a whole new understanding of genes came to be, and it's what I call the mixing board model. Um, it's not, it's the genes aren't, uh, don't have that finished, that information about what traits, finished traits are supposed to look like. Instead, genes do have instructions, but they're more like knobs and switches. They get turned on and off all the time. Scientists call it gene expression. So genes do have instructions, but how those instructions are carried out actually depends very much on other genes and also signals from the environment. So you can never say that a certain gene is going to absolutely produce uh, this certain outcome. Um, I shouldn't say never. Very, very rarely can you say that. It's really, and what we've come to understand in the last uh, 20 or 30 years is that really everything about genes is about gene expression. Or epigenetics is another way, another way to say that. So here's a, way, here's a quote that sums up the current thinking of genes and, uh, and how traits uh, are... are are developed. There are no genetic factors that can be studied independently of the environment, and there are no environmental factors that function independently of the genome. A trait emerges only from the interaction of gene and environment. That's from Michael Meany, who is, uh, take my word for it, a, a top geneticist today. He's at McGill University in Canada. Now, how does this work? What, what's going on with gene expression? Well, this is an image of an old model where DNA does have instructions, and those instructions are being passed through an RNA messenger and then taken outside the nucleus, and those instructions are used to assemble amino acids into a new protein. And that's all basically still true, but the new understanding of genes adds one very, very important wrinkle, and that is this hormone representing all sorts of environmental signals, really any signal at all in, inside 
uh, your body can talk to, can kind of interfere with the communication of the DNA and the RNA messenger. So yes, these instructions are coming down from the DNA, but how they're actually going to get carried out into assembling amino acids into new proteins is actually going to be affected constantly by signals coming from the outside, both from other genes and from hormones and lots of other things. And of course, we all know that everything we do on the outside of our, our bodies, every thought we have, every food we eat, every activity uh, we, we make is going to affect our body chemistry. So we are also affecting gene expression with, with everything we do. Now, um, this story gets really interesting when you couple it with brain plasticity, which everyone's heard of. Not too many people have heard of gene expression, but everyone's heard of brain plasticity. The, the brain's famous ability to, uh, to, uh, to morph and, and, um, and change in response to environmental demands. I'm showing this picture of a London cab because in 1999, there was a neurologist named Eleanor McGuire who took brain scans of London cab drivers. And she did that because London cab drivers are famous for this extraordinary knowledge that they develop over the years. It's very, very difficult to learn how to navigate all of the London streets. They actually call it the knowledge, and you have to get tested on it after several years. And uh, so it's, it's a rather developed skill. And she wanted to see if she could see uh, differences in the brains of, of London cab drivers. So she did some MRIs, and she compared the cab driver's brains to non-cabbies' brains. And in fact, she saw exactly what she was looking for. There's a part of the brain called the posterior hippocampus that actually uh, allows for our place memories. It's kind of our internal uh, map of, in our brains of, of how we understand the world outside of us. And the cab driver's brains had much bigger posterior hippocampi than the non-cab drivers. And most interestingly, the cab driver's experience and knowledge correlated with the size. Of their, of their posterior hippocampus. So what we have there is just a, a fantastic illustration of brain plasticity, the brain literally changing shape in response to environmental demands, uh, which is also in part driven by gene expression. Now, we've seen this in many studies now. We see it in viol studies of violin play players' brains and braille readers' brains and meditation practitioners' brains. We see the brain a dramatically changing shape in response to a practice and development of a certain skill. And we know that brain plasticity is going on on a much more subtle level with absolutely everything we do. Every thought you have, every memory you have, every memory you already have that you re-remember, laying down new pathways, changing subtly and then not so subtly the, the shape of your brain. So what does this mean for how we become who we are? What it means is that everything about who we be, how we become who we are is a process. I'm not saying we control that process completely or we can ever hope to, though the more we learn about it, the more we can control it, in, at least in small parts. But you could take uh, Albert Einstein and you could clone Albert Einstein 100% of the same genes and you really don't know what you're going to end up with. This is the law of gene environment interaction. This is the law of gene expression and, and brain plasticity. Um, of course, there are going to be physical similarities with 100% of the same genes, but we really do not know what a clone of Albert Einstein would look like, talk like, think like, how smart he would be, what, what his personality would, would be like, how he would feel. Um, the, the irony is that we're very fond of uh, saying when we see someone who's not doing so well in school, he's not going to be an Einstein. Well, you could clone Albert Einstein, he's not going to be an Einstein. Um, you could clone him 10 times, and that's going to be 10 different people, all, none of whom are going to be uh, uh, much like, I, I would suspect, the original uh, Albert Einstein. Now, there are two ways that I know this. One is, I've already talked about the biology of gene expression and brain plasticity. The second way is that we've actually cloned cats um, and other animals. Um, I mostly just wanted to include the side to see slide to see how big a cat could be. And <laughs> the, this, I think this could be the cat that eats San Francisco. If you, um, so this is Rainbow. She was cloned in 2001. It all started when her pet owner didn't want to lose her forever, et cetera, et cetera. But 
she managed to convince a scientist at Texas A&M University to clone her. And what do you think her clone looks like? <laughs> I am not making this up. I got these pictures from the person who cloned these two cats. Now, um, obviously, uh, actually, they're roughly the same age in this picture because, um, because they, uh, they allowed uh, CC was her name, Carbon Copy, it's what they named the clone, um, uh, to grow up. And, and so now we have some good pictures of them both as adults. So this is a, just a wonderful, you know, picture tells a thousand words example of what gene expression is, how powerful it is, and how we've got to just get rid of this whole idea of clones and this whole idea of innateness actually really also needs to be uh, wiped away. So. Uh, Coming back to uh, the quote from the bell curve, putting it all together, success and failure in the American economy and all that goes with it are increasingly a matter of the genes that people inherit. Well, we've got to change that pretty dramatically. Uh, in fact, in reality, success is a matter of the process that we tap into. And that's what this is all about. That's why we're all here. Um, now, are there differences between us uh, in genes, obviously there are. Do those differences have influence? Of course they do. Genes influence everything. But we cannot talk about good and bad genes because the goodness and badness of genes depends on the lives we lead. When a, when a parent reads to a child, when a long distance runner runs up a mountain trail, when a violinist practices a concerto for two and a half hours. They are tailoring their own individual biology, biology to suit what they want. Um, there's a lot more to say about the science of, of human potential, but the fundamental point I want to leave you with tonight, which is a very optimistic point, I think, is that the human genome and the human brain are actually designed to adapt to environmental circumstances. That's really an inherent part of their design. So we, with that, I, th I think that we can push this big elephant out of the room. Um, to me, that says that Ted, the whole idea behind Ted is vindicated. What Ted is about, what parents are about, what schools are about, what every part of our civilization that that we love is about is helping us tailor our own lives and our own biology to, to what suits us best, what we decide suits us best. And, um, you know, we're used to reading basically every day in the paper something about how genes impact our lives. And that is true. Genes do impact our lives. And those stories are, are uh, sometimes overblown, but still fundamentally true. But what you don't read in the paper every day, but we should, is that it's just as true to say that the, our lives actually impact our genes. And to me, there is no more encouraging or inspiring idea out there. Thanks so much. <laughs>